So our patients can have lines for all sorts of different reasons. Of the many lines that they can have, one is probably the most intimidating as well as the least understood by those who don't work with them very often, and that is the pulmonary artery catheter. So let's start to break down this catheter and help it to make more sense for you starting with this lesson here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, so let's start things off talking about what is a PA catheter. So the pulmonary artery catheter, or PA cath, or PAC, uh, is also called the Swan-Gans catheter, and it's a specialized venous catheter that can actually give us a whole host of values related to cardiac function, hemodynamics, and perfusion. So these can be useful in evaluating patients with various cardiac or circulatory disease processes, uh, including pulmonary hypertension, as well as various shock states. Combined with other assessment measurements uh, and tools, we can have a fairly comprehensive view of our patient's hemodynamic state. All right, so before I go too much further, uh, it really helps if I quickly review the anatomy of the cardiovascular system. Now this is gonna be a super quick review. Um, if you do want more info on this, I'm actually gonna to link to two different lessons up above where I do go over this much better and in more detail. All right, so here is a diagram of the heart and the associated vasculature. It's helpful if we understand the chambers, the valves, the vessels, and ultimately the blood flow. So as you know, we have four chambers, two on the right here and two on the left, each side with an atrium and a ventricle. Thus, we have our right atrium, our right ventricle, then our left atrium, and our left ventricle. And so here we have a couple large veins called the vena cavas, and these are going to be our superior vena cava as well as our inferior vena cava. And these are bringing the deoxygenated blood back to the heart and emptying into the right atrium. So from here, the blood moves through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle before the right ventricle contracts, ejecting that blood through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. This blood is then on its way to the lungs to receive oxygen. So now we have the pulmonary veins, which now return the oxygenated blood to the left atrium. Um, this blood passes through the mitral valve and into the left ventricle before that left ventricle ejects the blood through the aortic valve into the aorta and onto the rest of the body for that oxygen to be used. So now back to our PA catheter. So our PA catheter is really a long balloon-tipped venous catheter that enters the venous blood system. Now, typically this is gonna be inserted via the right IJ, but we can also insert these in the left IJ, the subclavian veins, as well as the femoral veins. And so our catheter is gonna be passed into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From here, it's gonna make its way up through the pulmonic valve, and then it's gonna terminate in the pulmonary artery. The location and position of the catheter along this path really allows us an opportunity to sample or measure the blood at various points, which gives us many measurements and information related to the patient's hemodynamic state. I will be talking about these more in just a minute here. All right, so now let's quickly talk about the anatomy of our PA catheter and the associated measurements and the values that were afforded with its use. So let me actually preface this section by saying that I'm going to be covering the very basics of a pulmonary artery catheter, but in fact there are many different versions of this catheter that can provide additional measurements and additional information. Um, I will briefly discuss some of them here, but certainly not all and not in depth. All right, so here we have our pulmonary artery catheter from the hub outside the patient, uh, as well as its entire length through the anatomy of the heart. Now, our basic pulmonary artery catheter has four lumens. We have the white port, and this is gonna be something that we call the proximal infusion port. 
And so this is a vascular lumen that is the most proximal port, so it's usually around 31 centimeters from the very tip end of the catheter. And this is used to infuse fluids or medication and typically terminates in the vena cava or the right atrium. Next, we're gonna have the blue port, and this is gonna be our right atrial pressure. So this is again another vascular lumen just slightly distal to the white port. So this one sits around 30 centimeters from the tip. And we typically transduce this port to get a continuous measure of our patient's right atrial pressure, which is what our CVP is used to represent. Now this is a true right atrial pressure, um, but it may also be reading the CVP depending on the position of the catheter. That said, the right atrial pressure CVP that these give us a measure of right-sided preload. So the preload of the right ventricle before it contracts. Now this is also the port that we can inject fluid to get a cardiac output measurement if we have a capable catheter, which I will discuss shortly. All right, so our next lumen is gonna be our yellow port, and this is gonna be what we call the PA distal lumen. So again, another vascular lumen, but this is the most distal as it actually terminates at the very end of the pulmonary artery catheter inside the pulmonary artery. And so here we typically transduce this port as well to get a continuous measurement of our pulmonary artery pressure, as well as the opportunity to get a pulmonary artery occlusive pressure or a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which I will talk about in the future. So the pulmonary artery pressure is a reflection of right side cardiac pressures. So here, think of this as an A-line, but for the right side of the heart. And it's gonna be reflected with both a systolic and diastolic pressure. So here are pulmonary artery systolic and our pulmonary artery diastolic for this right ventricle. Now the pulmonary artery pressure as well as the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure can also be helpful in evaluating severity of mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis as well. Now this is also the port that we sampled to obtain a mixed venous oxygen saturation or SVO2. All right, so the final lumen is actually going to be our red or our balloon port. And this port here actually has a connected syringe and an on-off valve that is used to inflate the balloon near the distal tip of the catheter. So as you can see here, the balloon is not quite at the very end of the catheter, but pretty close. Now this balloon only holds 1.5 mLs of air. And in fact, the accompanying 3 mL syringe that uh, comes with it normally uh, actually has a uh, prevention mechanism uh, that won't allow you to withdraw more than 1.5 mLs of air to infuse into it. So it's really important that we maintain this specific syringe. Definitely, if uh, this does get lost, then we need to make sure and uh, have some specific markings on there, stating very clearly to only draw up 1.5 mLs of air. Now, the purpose of this balloon is it's actually used to guide floating the pulmonary artery catheter during insertion. So by having the balloon inflated, it helps to pull the catheter along with the flow of blood through the chambers and through the valves where we need it to go. Um, as well as it can also be used to temporarily occlude the pulmonary artery, allowing us to get that pulmonary artery occlusive pressure or that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And so by inflating this balloon, essentially we're blocking the pressure coming from the right ventricle. And so then the distal PA port, the yellow port on our swan, is then going to be giving us readings that are going to be very similar to the waveform of a right atrial pressure or a central venous pressure. Uh, and thus, this measurement is actually representative of left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or LVEDP, or the preload of the left ventricle. Now, some facilities do not allow the nurses to routinely get this value, and this is due to the fact that when it's inflated, it's completely occluding the pulmonary artery that it specifically resides in, preventing perfusion. Thus, it is absolutely imperative that you ensure this balloon is deflated when it's not actively getting this value. So in these cases where we don't typically use the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure, then we're typically going to use the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure in lieu of that. All right, so that was a lot kind of quickly flying through some of these pressures. I will actually do a separate lesson talking more about these pressures, waveforms, normal values, and more. All right, so with just those four lumens, we can get a lot of useful information, but we are still missing an important value that is needed to calculate a ton more measurements, and that is gonna be our patient's cardiac output. 
Now, with our basic pulmonary artery catheter, we can calculate a cardiac output using the FIC principle by obtaining an SVO2 and an SAO2 from an ABG. That said, we do have some specialty PACs that allow us to obtain a cardiac output through a process called thermodilution. And what this is, is this is the measurement of the temperature change of fluid as it passes through the heart. So this does actually require another port, something that we call the thermistor, and this actually records the real-time temperature in the pulmonary artery. Now, with this in place, we can actually use this to give us a core temperature reading as well, which is pretty nice. Now, the whole theory with the thermodilution is that the better someone's cardiac output is, the faster their blood is going to flow. And thus, if we inject a cold or cool temperature fluid, there's going to be less time for that fluid to warm back up before it reaches the thermistor, because it's going to be moving so quickly that temperature, we're going to see less of a change. And so the temperature of the fluid that's being injected into that blue right atrial pressure port is going to be recorded, and then the change in temperature is going to be recorded in the pulmonary artery, giving us a thermodilution curve as we inject that fluid, and then a cardiac output is calculated from that. Now this is done with 10 mLs of fluid that's injected, and typically we take three readings and then average the results to get our cardiac output. That said, uh, if we are doing this frequently, especially in patients that have sick hearts, we often will just use the one infusion each time to minimize the fluids that the patient's getting. So this is great and gives us an easy way to obtain a cardiac output calculation, um, but it's really only a moment in time and requires infusing fluid and then waiting for a value each time that you want to check the patient's cardiac output. Enter in the continuous cardiac output or CCO. So this pulmonary artery catheter allows us to have a continuous cardiac output and cardiac index reading without having to inject any fluid. Essentially, this uses a thermal filament along the outside of the catheter from the right atrium to the right ventricle. This filament turns on and off while at the same time the thermistor records the changes in temperature as a result. Now this happens repeatedly and continuously, giving us a continuous reading of our patient's cardiac output and cardiac index. And as a result, there is an extra cable coming off that is used to deliver power to this filament to produce heat. That said, the amount of heat that this produces is pretty minimal and it's not something that is going to impact our patient's body temperature. Now, this still works using the principle of thermodilution, uh, but it's much easier and, like I said, without having to give the patient additional fluids. We just look up and we can see what our patient's cardiac output is in the moment. All right, let's talk a little bit about our mixed venous oxygen saturation. Now, also, as discussed, we can draw a blood sample from the yellow, the distal PA port, and then run a VBG to get our patient's SVO2. But there are also special PA catheters that uh, have another lumen with a fiber optic cable that can be used to get a continuous SVO2 reading. Now, I did briefly discuss this concept at the end of a lesson where I was talking about pulse oximetry uh, that I will link to up above if you want to watch that. So that said, the SVO2, that this gives us a measurement of how much oxygen is left in the blood as it returns to the lungs to be oxygenated. And what this does is this tells us how much or potentially how little oxygen is being used by the tissue and can give us an idea about perfusion as well as oxygen utilization. This SVO2 value can also be used in the FIT calculation to determine cardiac output as well. Now, finally, in addition to all of the different above things that I talked about, we do also have some pulmonary artery catheters that can provide transvenous pacing for both atrial and ventricular uh, or a combination of both pacing. All right, so we covered a lot of info just now about the anatomy of the pulmonary artery catheter. Now let's quickly talk about some of the indications and contraindications for this catheter. So while we don't have any definitive indications, we most often will use them in patients with cardiovascular disease and dysfunction. So some examples here include the evaluation and optimization of acute or chronic heart failure. This can be especially helpful in unequal left versus right failure. We can use it to help differentiate cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It can be helpful in the evaluation and titration of support 
post-cardiac surgery. This is probably one of the most common cases that we use them, uh, as well as the evaluation and titration of support with mechanical circulatory support. So here, think your balloon pump, impella, et cetera. It can be helpful in the diagnosis and management of various shock states. So it can actually help us differentiate which shock uh, or evaluating mixed shock states, as well as our patient's fluid status. Can also be helpful in the diagnosis and management of pulmonary hypertension. Can help with the optimization of support when we're using vasopressors, inotropes, fluids, diuretics, or pulmonary vasodilators. So think about all these effects on hemodynamics. It can help in the evaluation of pericardial tamponade or constrictive pericarditis, as well as the assessment of right-sided valvular disease or cardiac shunts. Now, some potential contraindications include things like severe coagulopathies and thrombocytopenia, and this is going to be due to the bleeding risk of insertion. Not a definitive contraindication, but certainly something to be careful with is going to be patients that have a left bundle branch block. The insertion of the pulmonary artery catheter may lead to a transient right-sided bundle branch block, which if they already have a left in place could lead to a complete heart block. Um, if patients have transvenous placing leads already in place, uh, especially for patients that are actively being paced and dependent on these, these pacers, um, that this may not be a good idea to insert a pulmonary artery catheter at this point. Patients who have right-sided cardiac assist devices, so think of the Impella RP or a tandem, et cetera. If the patient has tricuspid or pulmonic valve repair or replacement, um, often these uh, post-valve patients are not going to have a pulmonary artery catheter post-op. Also, patients that have severe tricuspid valve or pulmonic valve disease, such as TR or PR, um, we don't want to use one of these in patients who have endocarditis, as well as infection and sepsis, and also patients who have right-sided tumors or blood clots. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to evaluate whether or not having a pulmonary artery catheter in place will change our evaluation and management of this patient. If not, then a pulmonary artery catheter really shouldn't be used. All right, so that was a lot of information talking about the basics of the pulmonary artery catheter. Hopefully this helps to make this make a little bit more sense for you guys um, so that you can understand some of the different parts and then why it is that we, we have it and what they're doing for us. Um, this is just the first lesson in a series of lessons where I'm going to be talking about this catheter, so make sure and stay tuned for future lessons. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.